Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about pathogenesis of HIV. This is the only virus that gets an entire lecture to itself, and that's because it's, it's probably the most substantial human viral pathogen. Um, and all this begins uh, back in 1981 with a report in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. This is a weekly publication by the CDC where it summarizes uh, diseases, morbidity and mortality of various diseases in the US. And here it noted in a period from October to uh, 1980 to May of 1981, five uh, young men, all active homosexuals, were treated with biopsy confirmed pneumocystis carini pneumonia at three hospitals in Los Angeles. Two of them died. All five patients had laboratory confirmed or previous or concurrent cytomegalovirus infection and candidal mucosal infection. So these were unusual because these are opportunistic infections, not common for young men to have these kinds of disease. And this occurred in a cluster of five. So this brought attention uh, to this. And at this point, the CDC got involved and there was subsequently increasing evidence for some sort of infectious disease. And eventually it was discovered to be caused by uh, this virus, human immunodeficiency virus. So it was first isolated in 1983, so just a few years after that initial uh, uh, MMWR report. It was from a patient in Paris with swollen lymph nodes, which is one of the characteristics uh, of the infection. The virus was then isolated later, both at NIH and UCSF here in the US. So the French were the first uh, to identify the virus. And uh, electron microscopy sequencing of the genome revealed that it was a retrovirus. And particularly, it was a lentivirus, which is already a known group uh, of retroviruses. So here's the retrovirus family, just to put this in perspective. We've talked about a few other retroviruses, and we'll talk about more of them next time. It's a family retroviridae. There is a subfamily within it, orthoretrovirini. And within that are a number of genera. So these alpha, beta, gamma, delta, these are genera of retroviruses. Uh, and here is the lentivirus genus, which contains HIV 1 and 2. There are two human immunodeficiency viruses. Uh, the other human retroviruses are within the Delta retrovirus genus. They're called HTLV1, 2, and 3. So this is a diagram of the virion. These, as you know, are enveloped. Uh, they have two plus strand RNA genomes within them. And in the in the virion, of course, there are also enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase, RNase H, protease. Uh, that we've talked about before. The genome, the proviral map is shown here at the bottom. So this is two LTRs flanking the coding region. And you can see the common retroviral proteins, GAG, PAL, and envelope. All right, the GAG's the structural proteins. PAL does the polymerase and the RNA sage and integrase. Uh, but in addition, you see that there are a number of other uh, proteins encoded in the genome. They're too light for you to see, probably. Uh, many more than we've talked about before. And these are all derived by various spliced versions of the genomic mRNA, as you can see here. So some of these proteins are called VIF, and TAT, REV, NEF, etc. And these all have various functions in replication. So this is why these are called complex retroviruses, because they encode more proteins than uh, some of the simpler ones that we've talked about. So uh, in terms of human retroviruses, there are two distinct groups. As I've mentioned already, we have the T lymphotropic virus, T cell lymphotropic viruses, HTLV1, 2, and 3. So the name tells you they have tropism for T cells. They cause various leukemias in people. Uh, and then that's one genus, the Delta retrovirus. And then the immunodeficiency viruses, HIV1 and 2. So again, these are lentiviruses. They're not new when they, were, when they were discovered in 1983. We had already known other lentiviruses, and in, in particularly in other animals. For example, equine infectious anemia virus causes an immunodeficiency of horses, was isolated in the 
or in the early 1900s. So not new viruses, just new for humans. So the name uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome and human immunodeficiency virus. Syndrome, of course, is the occurrence of a group of symptoms in an individual that was initially called a syndrome because we didn't really know uh, what caused it. Now the name has stuck. It's caused by HIV-1. So acquired immunodeficiency was given to it initially before we understood that it was a viral infection. HIV-1 is the agent of AIDS. There are many AIDS denialists that you can find very easily and they insist that HIV doesn't cause AIDS and I will just say they're wrong. It's clear that this virus causes AIDS and to argue otherwise is a waste of time. And we know, for example, that in, ad in addition to all the other evidence that there is, we have inadvertently given people HIV contaminated blood and they get AIDS. So that's the best test that you can have. So this is a major pandemic which is still ongoing and I want to spend five minutes now giving you some numbers because they're sobering. So in the US it's killed over 600,000 people which is more than all the combat deaths uh, of the US in the 20th century. Uh, at the moment over a million people in the US are infected, about a quarter of them don't know it. They don't feel anything and they haven't been tested. Uh, there are 40,000 new infections a year. 70% uh, in men, 30% in women, and half of the new infections in the U.S. occur in people 25 or younger. The global summary as of 2010, 34 million people uh, living with HIV. You can see the breakdown by gender and also there are a lot of children with AIDS typically born to mothers who are HIV infected. People newly infected in 2010, 2.7 million new infections globally and AIDS deaths in 2010, 1.8 million. Uh, adults and children with 2010, this is broken down by country. And you can see the burden is in sub-Saharan Africa, 22.9 million people uh, estimated to be living with AIDS. Uh, South and Southeast Asia also a high burden uh, followed by Latin America and North America. These are big numbers. Uh, adults and children newly infected in 2010. Not the burden of infection, but newly infected. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 1.9 new infections in 2010. Um, f far fewer, you can see, in the U.S. We've done a good job at controlling it. Deaths, adult and child deaths from age. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 1.2 million deaths in 2010. 20,000 in North America, quarter of a million in South and Southeast Asia. Children less than 15 years of age living with uh, a HIV in 2010. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 3.1 million. So a good fraction of the, f the population of the future is being decimated by this disease. Number of children newly infected in 2010. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa, 350,000 new infections in kids less than 15 years old. We're doing a pretty good job in many other countries, as you can see here, at limiting that. And finally, estimated deaths in young kids, 2010. Again, Sub-Saharan Africa is the brunt of the numbers here. So this is really uh, a serious pandemic. There are 7,000 new infections a day. This is a 2010 estimate. 97% in low and middle income countries. 1,000 of them in children under 15 years, 6,000 in adults. And the breakdown, almost half in women and almost half in young people as well. So this is an infection that is targeting future generations. Now in terms of uh, infectious diseases overall, this is morbidity and mortality due to selected infectious diseases. Here is the annual number of deaths the number one killer are, are, is lower respiratory infections, pneumonias. Diarrheal diseases, 2.1 million. A lot of rotaviral infections thrown in there. And HIV AIDS is number three. Two million deaths a year, followed by tuberculosis, malaria, and there's measles. Uh, quite high at the top of the list as well. So again, this is a serious infection. Now we have triple drug therapy as we will talk about in a couple of lectures, to control infection. So if you are infected, 
you can take three drugs, a combination of three drugs, and control the infection well, and you can have a very long life. And in fact, you can live a normal life um, with these three drugs. But the problem is that um, there's no cure. We can't get rid of virus from an infected individual. We don't have a vaccine, so we can't prevent infection, which would be really the ultimate uh, way to lower these numbers. You have to keep taking the antivirals for the rest of you lo your life. If you stop taking them, the virus will return. And that is because, uh, as you know, retroviruses integrate into your DNA. And what's more problematic here is that they integrate into long-lived cells. They are quiescent in many of these cell types, but the cells are around a long time. And in particular, we think uh, the hematopoietic progenitor cells that give rise to many of the cells in the blood are latently infected. That is, they have a genome in them. They don't make virus, but the genome is there. And then if you stop taking drugs, eventually those cells will be the source of new virus. We had a great conversation on TWIV with Kathy Collins, who works on this uh, hematopoietic reservoir of HIV, if you're, if you're interested in learning more about that. Also with triple therapy, even though three drugs is a good number to keep the resistant mutants down, you still get resistance, so you have to keep on top of this as well. But more importantly, these drugs are really expensive, and three of them at a time makes it even more expensive. It can't, they can't be afforded in many countries. Even though we're making great inroads through donations such as Gates and so forth, many countries can't afford them. And as a consequence, that's where the major burden of the disease is now in third world countries. All those deaths are all preventable using these drugs. Um, and it's really, it's really sad that they are continuing. Now, before we go on and talk about HIV-1, there is another human immunodeficiency virus you should know about, HIV-2. This is restricted primarily to Western Africa. It's less virulent and it's less transmissible than HIV-1. It has uh, some homology to it and also has homology to uh, simian immunodeficiency viruses, which we will talk about in a bit. Um, if you are infected with HIV-2, you get antibodies that react with SIV. Um, and um, this also causes, SIV causes an AIDS-like disease uh, in macaques as well, yes. So that is something we're going to talk about today. Yes, the answer is antibodies do form in people infected with uh, HIV-1 or HIV-2. And we'll talk about the problems with that a bit later. All right, now let's talk first about the origin of HIV. This is a zoonosis, a virus infection of humans that originated in animals. And the, the jump happened some time ago. Um, but first we have to look at the lentiviruses. So this is a list of some lentiviruses of different animals. You can see horses, sheep, goats, cow, and cats. They all have their uh, lentiviruses and these cause um, immunodeficiency types of infections. And we have the primate uh, lentiviruses. We have simian immunodeficiency virus, which has probably been around for many, many years. Uh, and then human immunodeficiency virus. And what the current thinking is that HIV represents a cross-species jump of SIV from certain primates uh, into people. So HIV 1 and 2, in fact, came from separate colonization infants. That is a jump from, of a virus from an infected animal uh, to humans. And the viruses involved are SIVs, simian immunodeficiency viruses. Now, uh, HIV 1s are divided into groups and then subgroups. And so there are four groups. They're called M, N, O, and P. And these are each thought to represent separate jumps of viruses from monkeys into people, from what we can tell about comparing sequences of human and monkey isolates. Group M, in addition, is divided into at least nine different clades. These are all based on sequence alignments, primarily the envelope glycoprotein and the GAG uh, structural genes. So there are a number of clades within the group M. And these have different geographic distributions and they change with time, the distributions of these clades. And these are, this is important because 
a vaccine would have to target many of these depending on wh wh what the population is. So in some countries, uh, there is uh, only a few clades, and in other countries, there are more. So uh, Africa has the most number of different clades. You can see by the, just the different colors here. And that, so that means if you want to vaccinate within Africa, you have to have a multi-clade vaccine. Uh, clade B predominates in the US and Western Europe. As you can see here, so in the US, we might be able to use a single clade vaccine, but again, there is, there is always travel into the US, so it might not be feasible. Uh, this also changes. We've watched the C clade start from very small numbers in Africa, and it's expanding. And we don't quite understand why this is, but this is something, again, that has to be kept track of for uh, vaccine development. Now, when you sequence HIVs from people and SIVs from monkeys, then you get clues about the origins. And a number of people have gone into the jungles of Africa and sequenced simian immunodeficiency isolates from chimpanzees, for example, um, and, it, and it, in fact have found isolates of SIV that are nearly identical to HIV. So from this has come the thought that uh, HIV emerged from an SIV and a chimpanzee. So here on this uh, phylogenetic uh, map of sequences of different uh, lentiviruses, these are all lentis here, you can see the various other uh, feline, bovine, equine, and lentiviruses down here. Here's HIV-1 and 2 near the top. And you can see uh, HIV-1, for example, is very similar to an SIV from a chimpanzee. That's what CPZ means. And, uh, furthermore, HIV-2 seems to be very similar to an SIV identified in a uh, sooty mangabe. It's a kind of monkey. All right, so the idea is that these viruses in humans that are circulating now came from monkey viruses at some point. So when would that be? So to try and answer that question, people have been digging into archival tissue specimens and trying to find evidence of HIV infection a long time ago. Because we, the AIDS epidemic began in the U.S. in um, 80-81, but we'd like to go further back to get some idea of where the viruses originated. So. Um, the oldest sample is a 1959 serum sample from uh, a Democratic Republic of the Congo adult male. Um, so this was a stored sample. It was taken in 1959 for other purposes. And then this individual was found to be HIV positive in 1998. And uh, people were se searching through archival specimens and they were able to sequence the genome from that. Uh, not too long ago, one was found from same country, an adult female, a lymph node sample from 1960, and again, the genome was sequenced. Uh, subsequently, 1969, a U, a HIV from a U.S. teenager who died in that year, and finally, 1976, uh, HIV in, in tissue from a Norwegian sailor. So these are all samples that predate the identification uh, of the virus in 1983. So if you sequence these, you can then construct trees, uh, and see how different they are. You can calculate rates of evolution. And then by looking at the SIV sequence, try and estimate when these viruses went from monkeys um, to humans. So the initial estimates were that this jump, this jump from monkey to people, went, happened around 1931, plus or minus 15 years. So again, that's looking at the sequence. Then as these other isolates were brought into play, this was based mainly on the 1959 sequence as the other isolates were brought into play that was uh, expanded to somewhere between 1884 and 1924 and in particular comparing the 59 and, and 60 sequences you could get an idea of how much the virus has changed and then backdate it to see when it would have jumped uh, from monkeys so that's the current estimate somewhere in the late 1800s to the early uh, 1900s would be this jump from monkeys to people yes I was led to believe, probably mistakenly, that it was one crossover event on the Congo River circa 1920. Uh, but you're saying that genetically there were more than mm -hmm. one crossover event of SIV. Yes. HIV. Yeah, so S HIV 1 and 2 are two separate events, and then within HIV there have been four uh, colonization events. And what you're saying that there are four separate crossovers? Or yes, crossing from animals to people. There are four for HIV 1. Uh, most of these old specimens come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is thought to be the epicenter of the outbreak. Uh, this, uh, this city, Kinshasa, was not 
very populous in the early 1900s, but as it grew in population, that population growth coincided with the onset of, of HIV infection. And there are three theories that have been set forth for how this happened. The first is the hunter theory, that hunters who are looking for chimpanzee meat for food, they hunt it, they catch it, they butcher it, and they sell it in market. There's ample opportunity uh, for them to be infected. Uh, and then colonialism in Africa, with the growth of colonial centers in that country uh, in the early to 1920s, 1930s, for example, uh, there, were, there, were, there were growth conditions and a lot of the residents uh, were used in labor camps to get things done. So they were subjected to harsh conditions, probably didn't, uh, had high susceptibility to infectious diseases. So this was a perfect environment for viruses to spread in. Uh, in addition, they were given prostitutes uh, to amuse them and that probably spread the infection as well. Furthermore, they were immunized against smallpox to prevent them from getting sick so that they could work. And since needles were expensive, they would use the same needle over and over again. And that probably helped spread whatever virus was present. So the great expansion in populations, the colonial growth uh, in the 1920s and onwards probably contributed to the spread of this virus from its origin in an animal uh, to people. Now, of course, these are all theories. You can't prove them, but uh, you can look at the, the origin of these viruses and get some ideas about correlations. But we do know what we do suspect, and it's probably correct, is that this began in an animal and somehow made it into the human populations. Now, HIV is not a particularly infectious virus, um, like measles, which where the RO is 15 to 20 people. One person can infect uh, 15 to 20 others. Uh, it's not spread by res respiratory routes. It's, it's not spread by vectors. It's not spread by... Uh, contaminated feces like rotaviruses. This has to be either uh, needles or person-to-person -person contact. And you can see here in the US a graph which is uh, the number of AIDS cases here on the Y axis in thousands with year. And you can see three different modes of transmission, male-to-male uh, -male sexual contact, intravenous drug use, and heterosexual contact. So you can see the peak uh, in the 90s of male-to-male -male transmission and with information being spread about the transmission that declined. Intravenous drug use also peaked and that declined as well and heterosexual contact has increased slowly in the US. Uh, globally though 80 to 85 percent of the transmission is, is heterosexual and the others are very small parts of it. Blood transfusions, intravenous drug use, homosexual activity. So this is clearly globally uh, a heterosexual transmitted virus and most of these cases as you recall originate in uh, sub-saharan africa the virus can be found in various fluids of the body as well as cells so this is a, a table showing that these are various cell-free fluids and the virus whether you can get virus in those or not this is infectious virus plasma uh, has quite a bit of virus in it uh, semen vaginal and cervical secretions all are sources of infection and we also can find virus infected cells so you can find peripheral blood mononuclear cells have a lot of virus in them semen contains cells which also contain virus and the same with vaginal and cervical fluid so it's likely that a combination of free virus particles or virus infected cells serve to transmit uh, infection yes Why aren't tears uh, modes of spread? Or basically anything that has the virus in it. Yeah, well, I, th spread I, I think that the amount of virus, if you look here, estimated quantity of virus is very low in tears. So even though some samples were positive, it's very low. And, you know, unless you cry, there's no opportunity to transmit infection. So. so I'm not tearing. Well, you have water on your eyelid, sure. I can imagine a scenario without an open wound, but the fact is, really the fact is that there's, <laughs> there's not much virus here. <laughs> there's not much virus here. <laughs>
that's the bottom line, I think. And that's why it hasn't been transmitted. Same with saliva, milk, mother's milk. Um, not just not a lot. Okay, so this is an interesting study done in Uganda a number of years ago, uh, 21, 2001, where they looked at discordant heterosexual couples. So this means one, it, it's uh, a married couple where one person is HIV infected and the other is not. And they just follow them over time and see if the other person gets infected. And this is split up into a number of ways. So this is the probability of transmission per coital act. And it's divided into viral load. So how much virus you have in the blood, starting from very low amounts to different amounts. This is HIV copies per mil. And it's also split up into people without genital ulcer disease or with. And you can see red is with. And this increases the likelihood that you are going to transmit virus among these discordant couples. All right. So you have open wounds. That allows the virus to get in. And if you don't, it's harder. And in fact, these are quite low rates of infection. You see um, the number here. Out of 10,000 coital acts, a, a 10 probability, this equates to about 1 in 200 sex acts. So that's your likelihood of being infected, 1 in 200 times. Yes? Um, yeah, I believe this is a mix. I don't know the numbers, though. Yeah. This is a very interesting story uh, because some of these individuals didn't know that their partners were infected and um, they, had to, they had to eliminate them from the study. Uh, you should read the original paper. It's really interesting how they, they went about doing this. So it's 1 in 200, okay? So if you have a person who's HIV infected, uh, the chances of them transmitting infection is 1 in 200. But just remember, the first time could be that one time. So don't take your chances, all right? <laughs> So it doesn't transmit very effectively. Yes? Can I just ask, this is really viral question, but why is there like an interest in distinguishing between heterosexual and homosexual Oh, because when the disease was first identified, people said it was a gay disease, right? right? And this was, was an incredible bias because people didn't care about it, and it, it stunted the progress on the virus for a long time. And to this day, there are people who think it's a, it's a gay disease, and it's not. So that's why people are trying to educate the world about it and say, look, this is heterosexually transmitted. That's the main reason. So it's not transmitted effectively. It has to be very close person-to-person -person contact or intravenous drug use. Um, the kinds of conditions that the virus would experience outside of the body inactivated. Drying inactivates it very quickly. Heating, bleach, pH extremes. It's a very labile virus. And so this makes sense that it has to be transmitted uh, by close contact. So you can imagine that the original hunter who acquired this infection was probably butchering an animal and got cut and got blood on himself and, and that is how the, the virus originally infected him. And then by passing through sexual contact from person to person, it's selected for that property uh, even more. Now the virus uh, it gets into cells by binding two, two receptors. Uh, we talked about this a while ago. Uh, and the second of the two receptors, so CD4 is one of the receptors needed for attachment. And this explains a lot of the properties of the disease. This targets and kills CD4 T cells. But it then needs a co-receptor, which is a chemokine receptor of some kind. It's either a, uh, an alpha or a beta chemokine receptor, CXCR4 or CCR5. So two distinct co-receptors. And in fact, um, this determines the kinds of, of tropism of HIV that emerge. So the T cell tropic strains, that is the strains that like to infect T cells, prefer uh, CXCR4 as a uh, co-receptor. Then we have macrophage tropic strains, which prefer CCR5. Um, and these, this change in an individual um, in the course of infection. Um, so let's, let's look at a typical HIV infection and see what happens. So we start by getting infected. We acquire virus in some way. Uh, and as you have learned in this course, one of the first things that happens when a virus comes and infects you is that your dendritic cells come along and try and find out what's going on. Uh, and 
uh, this, the dendritic cell binds HIV very well through this protein called DC sign. It's a protein on the surface of the dendritic cell. The virus doesn't infect dendritic cells. This, these, they don't have the proper receptors. But the dendritic cells, as, as I think I've told you before, bring the virus into the lymph node where there are plenty of CD4 positive T cells uh, for it to infect. So unwittingly, the dendritic cells bring it to the right place. When you get infected, you're typically infected with the macrophage tropic strains that, that like to bind uh, the co-receptor CCR5. And then many years later, towards the end stage of disease, you mainly have the T cell tropic strains in your body. But what you transmit, if you do transmit to another one, is a subset of those, which are the M-tropic strains. We don't really understand that. It must be that these are better for transmission. All right, so the virus is delivered to the lymph nodes. It, it replicates very well in CD4 positive T cells in the lymph node. You get high levels of virus produced as a consequence, so you get a viremia. The virus spreads throughout you. It can access any lymph node then. It has plenty of CD4 positive T cells in which to replicate. When this is happening, of course, you're making an immune... Yes? Well, there's, there's some idea that they do infect macrophages. That's, that's why the name has arisen. There is still controversy about whether this happens, but the name has stuck. Yeah. Um, so you do make an immune response, uh, and this limits virus replication. We'll look at a graph of this in a moment. And then in about six months, uh, your virus titers have reached what's called a set point, which you will now have for the next X number of years, depending on the course of your disease. So initially, you have a very effective immune response that brings the virus down, but it doesn't eliminate it entirely. So this is our primary infection, this initial infection and replication and spread of the virus. Primary HIV infection, 50 to 90% of these are uh, symptomatic, so not many asymptomatic infections. Uh, the, the symptoms that occur occur within a month after exposure, as early as five days. And these are some of the symptoms and signs of infection, some typical signs of a virus infection, fever, fatigue, malaise, aches, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but then some more specific uh, uh, symptoms like adenopathy, swelling of lymph nodes, pharyngitis, weight loss, uh, ulcerations, and, and aseptic meningitis. You can also have uh, certain blood types reduced in their numbers. So this happens for about 14 days in average, again, from 5 to 30 days. And that's the primary infection. Now, um, one of the very striking alterations that occurs uh, is in the uh, GI tract. The GI tract of a normal person is lined with collections of lymphoid cells. This is the so-called gut-associated lymphoid tissue, and you can see this uh, in this photograph here, all these uh, yellow areas, these are lymph cells, and they are there to protect you. They sample the environment and make sure uh, nothing's coming in. Here's an individual who's HIV positive, uh, just a few weeks after initial infection, and you can see all of the lymph cells are gone. They've all been destroyed by virus infection. So no, no lymphoid, no GALT, no gut-associated lymphoid tissues. So this is a a large source of the initial virus replication. So here's a graph of these events that we've talked about a little bit so far. So we have the initial infection here. On the bottom is the viral RNA load, representative of uh, virus. Can't do a plaque assay of HIV, so you measure its RNA by PCR assays. And at the top is the CD4 positive T cell count. So this is a, a measure of the course of the disease. So here you have that initial burst of viremia, which is controlled by the immune response uh, by six months. And then you have the viral set point, which the patient can have for the next eight to 10 years. And in terms of CD4 positive T cells, uh, so initially you have a decline, it, re it rebounds. And then over the years of incubation, the number of CD4 positive T cells slowly go down and down until you reach a point which is here at eight years when the patient begins to develop immunodeficiency. So here the numbers of T cells are no longer sufficient to protect you from opportunistic infections. The T cells, the CD4 T cells, of course, provide help for B cells 
for the production of antibodies, so you can't fight off infections. Now, initially, your CD8 positive T cells, your cytotoxic T cells, respond to infection, uh, and they go back to normal levels, and they are maintained through the course of this incubation period. But in the um, period of the development of AIDS, they start to go down as well. And this is because there's a general impairment of the immune response there. In addition to killing the CD4 positive T cells, uh, virus infection causes many other immune dysfunctions which extend to T cells, CD8 T cells, and macrophages. So by the end stage of disease, your, your immune cell, your immune system is non-functional. And these individuals die of other infections. In fact, the virus uh, runs out of steam. So during this immunosuppression period, there's a burst of virus replication because it's no longer being cleared. You know, this set point is maintained there by an immune response. But at some point, the immune system has been destroyed. The virus replicates to high levels, but then it kills all of the cells that it replicates in. So now the titers are going back down again, and eventually this individual will die of some other infection. So the virus itself is not killing you directly, but you have opportunistic infections. Yes? Um, do you have like, a young person like, present with like, AIDS and have a low CD4 positive T cell count? Would there be like, any way to reverse that and sort of be giving them more? Yeah, you can treat them with antivirals, and the CD4 counts will rise. Absolutely. And the, so the triple therapy is great if you catch it early enough. You can reverse this and the CD4 counts will return to normal. And as, as long as you stay on the triple therapy, you'll be fine. So they can go from having AIDS back to just HIV positive? So they will remain HIV positive. Those individuals still have detectable virus in the blood, but they don't develop AIDS. Yes? Why can't the CD8s just You need antibodies. The, the, apparently the antibodies uh, are essential for clearing it. And we'll see, um, I mean the CD8s are important. If you didn't have those, it would be probably worse. I'm going to show you some data uh, at the end that, that indicates the importance of CD8s as well. But clearly the antibodies are essential uh, for getting rid of infection. Yeah. Yes? Uh, which one are you talking about this? Yeah, or even the slide before Well, I mean, some of these symptoms, um, some of these symptoms are rather characteristic uh, of primary HIV. Um, so, you know, if you were in a certain risk group, if you had, if you're an IV drug user or a prostitute, you had risk and you presented with these symptoms, they would just do a CD4 count and it would be picked up. Yeah. So you can't diagnose it just on the symptoms. You have to have a laboratory confirmation. Yeah. What about a bone marrow transplant? Uh, a bone marrow transplant would, would work, but then the transplanted cells would all get infected again. But what does work is to get a bone marrow transplant from an individual uh, who is lacking the gene for CCR5. So about 10% of the human population is lacking CCR5 and they're fine and they are resistant to HIV infection and so in fact not many uh, about five years ago an AIDS patient in Germany was given a bone marrow transplant from a donor with a CCR5 mutation and he has so since then been free of virus so yes you can do bone marrows but you have to do it with someone with this mutation otherwise they will just make CD4 cells which will serve for virus replication now that's not the way to cure the disease though. Bone marrow transplants are expensive and have a high lethality association associated with them. So there's gotta be a better way, but it illustrates the principle of, of being able to do this. What people actually are trying to do now is a target. One approach is to target some of these genes, CD4, CCR5, and see if you can disrupt those and there, thereby control the disease. Any, anything else? Okay. So that's, what, that's the course of a disease. Now, um, during that interperiod between the primary infection and the immunodeficiency, you have active viral replication. Uh, outside of the blood, outside of the CD4 cells in the blood, there are other reservoirs of infection. There is the gut tissue, which I told you about. 
cells in the CNS get infected as well, the genital tract. You make a huge amount of virus in this period between the primary and the, uh, the end stage disease. You make 10 to the 10th virions per day and they turn over, huge numbers. Um, the half-life of the virus in plasma is less than six hours and maybe 30 minutes. 30 minutes, and then you make more. So you have huge genetic variability, and this is part of the problem that uh, we encounter, that these viruses make mutations as they replicate, and since you're making so many, uh, the opportunity to select mutants is very great. So this is just an illustration of that. You have CD4 positive cells in your blood. These are infected. They produce a lot of virus. Um, they make about 99% of the virus that's circulating in you. And I said this has a, a very short half-life. The virus infects uninfected CD4 cells. These are always regenerated from your bone marrow, of course. Uh, and these end up in this cycle until there are not enough cells to sustain uh, virus production. And on the right are infections of other kinds of compartments. Latently infected lymphocytes, uh, these, these don't produce virus, but they have genomes in them, and they can at some point reactivate and then produce virus, which will go on and infect you. So if you're on triple therapy, you get rid of all the blood virus, or most of it, as soon as you stop, these latently infected cells can produce more. And then there are these long-lived cell populations, in which, and one of them we think is the hematopoietic uh, precursor population right here, the multipotent progenitor cells, these are latently infected, they don't produce virus, but upon some stimulus, they will produce virus, and you can't get rid of those. They seem to be uh, continuously infected. So here are three different, yes? Well, it can be brought in by infected cells. Cells can easily get through the the blood-brain barrier, and if those cells have viruses in them, they can get across, for example. So here are three different courses of HIV infection. A typical progressor, you have the primary infection, the burst of viremia, many years before the virus goes up uh, and um, AIDS develops, so eight to 10 years. We have rapid progressor, where this all happens very quickly. You have the primary infection, and then within a year, uh, the individual develops AIDS. And then we have non-progressors. You have uh, clinical infection initially, the primary infection. You reach a set point and your CD4 cells remain steady, the virus remains steady, and you never develop AIDS. All right, so these are non-progressors. So obviously these are very interesting to study to find out why they're not progressing. Maybe we can get clues about uh, how to limit infection. That's different from people who lack the Receptors. These are people actually infected, but right. These individuals are infected. Uh, they have low levels of virus. Uh, they have CCR5 receptor, but for other reasons, they don't progress the disease. So I want to emphasize the extent of immune cell dysfunction in this disease. It's not just CD4 positive T cells that are infected. Of course, when you destroy those, you destroy the ability to make uh, antibodies, but other immune cell types, not all of which are infected, are, their function is compromised. CD8 positive T cells, monocytes and macrophages, uh, B cells and NK cells, all of them have some defect. Um, and not all of it is understood. Some of it may be mediated by soluble uh, products that inhibit their function. But the end result is that you have this huge immunodeficiency after so many years. You can't fight off any common infection that we all can. So this is clinical AIDS. This is after this long period of incubation when you start to get opportunistic infection. You have less than 200 uh, CD4 positive T cells per mil of blood. You start to get a variety of infections including protozoans, uh, pneumocystis, and that's one of the protozoal infections that was first detected in these five men in Los Angeles. Toxoplasma, isospora, <coughs> cryptosporidium, microsporidia, bacterial infections like tuberculosis and uh, treponema, syphilis, fungal infections, viral infections, and then you get cancers as well. You get EBV lymphoma, Kaposi's sarcoma, anogenital carcinoma, and then neurological symptoms. 
from the presence of virus in the CNS, meningitis, myelopathies, neuropathies, and what's called an AIDS dementia complex. So you can see this not only allows infections, but other uh, problems as well. The neurological symptoms probably arise uh, when cells in the CNS are producing a variety of cytokines. So here we have uh, the blood-brain barrier, the virus, uh, can get in in an infected cell is shown here. It can replicate in the, in the infected cell. It can then make its way into macrophages, the microglia of, of the CNS. And in so doing, it will release cytokines. These infected cells release cytokines, which are thought to mediate a good deal of the neurotoxicity of the virus in the CNS. So you can see here virus and viral proteins and cytokines are mediating neuro neurotoxicity and neurological symptoms. Here's on the right is just an example of a macrophage microglia in the CNS being uh, infected with HIV and all of the cytokines that are known to be produced uh, in response. We've talked about many of these before, TNF-alpha, uh, nitric oxide, et cetera, and these are all believed to contribute to, this, to these neurological symptoms of uh, HIV infection. In cancers, um, there's an increase in malignancy in these individuals. As I've said, 40% uh, of, of individuals with AIDS develop cancers. Uh, this is due to two main things. One is the immune system is no longer doing proper tumor surveillance. We depend on it to, to early detect transformed cells and eliminate them. And when you have this immunosuppression, you can't do that anymore. So no immune surveillance. Uh, and then a lot of cytokines are always being made. You saw in the CNS the cytokines being made by microglia and macrophages. These are being made all over you in, in whatever cells are infected. And the effect of many of these cytokines is to, con is to push cells to proliferate continuously. And as you'll see next time when we talk about transformation, uh, making a cell replicate nonstop is a recipe for uh, transformation and oncogenesis. So a lot of the tumors that arise, arise because the cytokines are pushing cells to divide relentlessly. And, and uh, here's an example of one of these tumors, Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh, this was an old cancer described a long time ago. Um, before AIDS, before the AIDS epidemic, it was described mainly in men, older men in the Mediterranean area. And it, just, it shows as a uh, sarcoma of the skin. With the onset of AIDS, it became more prevalent. It occurs in 20% of uh, HIV-infected men. And in AIDS patient, you, you require co-infection with human herpes virus 8 in order to develop Kaposi's sarcoma. So pre-AIDS, um, pre this virus probably uh, caused the sarcomas on its own, but now with uh, immunosuppression caused by HIV, you see an increased incidence of this viral infection. So it's a very, it was a very, it was one of the diagnostics early on for uh, AIDS because this was a very rare tumor and all of a sudden it's, it was being seen in more and more people. B cell lymphomas are also common. These are tumors of B cells, very common in, in AIDS patients. These tumors arise in lymph nodes and intestines, brain, uh, liver, and they can be associated with infected by infection by different herpes viruses, as you can see here. And the idea, again, is that we have infection of HIV. The infection leads to the production of cytokines. Cytokines have a purpose, right, to uh, coordinate the proper immune response, but they also are made continuously in this case because we're making virus in huge quantities every day, making too many cytokines, and these stimulate cells to proliferate endlessly. B cells, endothelial cells, epithelial cells, and then in combination with another virus that leads to the formation of a tumor. So a B cell with EBV or HHV8, you get uh, B cell lymphomas. Uh, endothelial cells with uh, HHV8, you get Kaposi's sarcoma. And epithelial cells with human papillomavirus carcinomas. So the combination of cytokine production and other viruses which have easy access now because you're immunosuppressed lead to these kinds of, of malignancies. So can we make a vaccine to control HIV? Many people are trying very hard to do this. If you look at viral load versus uh, 
antiviral immunity in an infected person, you see that there is a response. You get a, and they, again, the initial peak of virus in primary infection, you get an immune response, which persists throughout the years of virus replication, eventually goes down at the end because there are no immune cells left. But there is an immune response, but we still have virus production. So this immune response is apparently not enough to eliminate infection. It apparently can control it, so it's reduced it from this high point here, but it never eliminates it. So why is that? Well, the reason is due to the huge numbers of virus particles that are made every day and the huge numbers of mutants that are present in them. We'll talk in a few weeks about how mutation arises from genome replication. But basically what happens is every time an antibody is produced against a, a particular kind of HIV in you, the virus simply escapes it. Uh, there is a small population that is not reactive with the antibody and those proliferate. So let's look here. You're infected with purple HIV. You make antibodies against purple HIV, but by the time these antibodies arise, it takes a couple of weeks, 14 days or so, purple HIV is gone and it's replaced by orange. And orange is not neutralized by the, the antibodies against purple. You now start to make antibodies against orange and now you have a mix of purple and orange <laughs> antibodies. By, by the time they reach certain levels, you now have a different HIV in you. Yes? Well, this one is really replicating to levels greater than most virus infections. 10 to the 10th per day is, is about the highest I know of. So, uh, I mean, it's a good question. I don't think we have an answer, but I think the sheer numbers is part of it and the mutability of this virus as well. <coughs> so the virus is always escaping antibody responses. Yes? There is, and in fact, we have just found them, not me, but virologists have found them, and I'll tell you a little bit about them, but that's a good hope for vaccine candidate, a conserved epi epitope that can't change because it has structural constraints, yeah. Um, here on the right are just some data so you can see where this cartoon comes from. Uh, these are plasmas taken at zero, six, and 12 months from an HIV-infected patient, and um, what we've done is make dilutions of the plasma and try and neutralize virus infectivity. So you mix the plasma with virus and then you see if it can infect cells. So if you have neutralizing antibodies, the virus won't infect. So um, here you can see 0% um, inhibition with month zero virus versus month zero plasma. So this is a good match, uh, no inhibition. And as you um, dilute out the virus, um, you do So this is diluted here as you get more concentrated with serum 10 to the 1, so only a tenfold dilution, you have good neutralization. So let's go in the other way. You go from concentrated serum to diluted, uh, you see you lose neutralization. That makes sense. Uh, as you go on with 6-month plasma and 12-month plasma, uh, you get less and less effective, you get more effective neutralization. So now the, this, will, this serum will, de, will neutralize virus at a greater dilution than the month zero plasma. So you're making better antibodies to month zero virus. But the problem is month zero virus is no longer in you. The patient now has month 12 virus, which isn't effectively neutralized by zero, six, or 12 month serum. A little better by 12 month, but you can see that this is an escape virus. And this happens over and over. It, it happens continuously. As soon as you make uh, new antibodies and you're continuously doing so, there's a new crop of escape viruses that arise. And then eventually you've lost such a fraction of your CD4 cells, you can't make any more antibodies. Uh, and that's the end stage disease. So that is why we do make antibodies to answer your original question, but the virus simply escapes them. And so um, that has been tough for vaccine development um, because if you immunize someone, if, if that virus 
if they're then infected with the virus, it could change quickly enough to escape the initial protection. So most of the trials with AIDS vaccine candidates have failed. There's only been one trial in Thailand uh, where there was a marginal effect of immunization, I think 30% improvement, but that's minimal. You need to have uh, higher than 60 or 70% efficacy. But recently, some broadly neutralizing antibodies have been identified in people. So you take a patient that has AIDS and you look at the antibodies within them, and there have some that have been identified that can neutralize HIV-1 isolates across clades. So you remember uh, the M group of HIV-1 has <laughs> about nine different clades. And these, they're all independently, um, these, these viruses are not neutralized by antibodies against the other one that you would typically find in serum. So if you wanted to protect someone against all nine clades, you'd have to have nine different vaccines. <coughs> but some antibodies in people have been found that will neutralize uh, across all of these clades. So these are called broadly neutralizing antibodies. And they recognize conserved epitopes on the envelope glycoprotein. These do not change because if they change, you wouldn't have the right structure of the glycoprotein and it wouldn't work anymore. So these are identified in amazing ways because you can isolate B cells from people. You can clone them out and identify the ones that make these antibodies. And then you clone out the uh, antibody producing genes from those cells. So we have the ability now to make these in large quantities. So one, uh, one, one way of using them would be to give these antibodies to people, okay? But that's really expensive. Uh, it requires injection, it's hard to do. The other is to try and figure out how to elicit the production of these antibodies. So to take the conserved epitopes and somehow translate that into a vaccine. Now the, the puzzle here is that these antibodies, and those of you who have taken immunology will get this, these are extensively hypermutated. So these have been through many, many rounds of selection in the B cell germinal center. So normally to get high affinity antibodies, uh, B cells are cycled in the germinal centers versus the antigen until you get a high affinity uh, reaction. These have been through more than most antibodies that have seen. They have many, many mutations uh, that point to this. And so they're very hard to make and they're very rare. They're not in every infected person. And in the people where they are found, they are very, very low percentage. And that's why those people aren't helped by them. So figuring out how to translate this into a vaccine is going to be tough. But the, the principle is there. We know what epitopes to use and so presumably we can get this to work. Same has been done for influenza virus, by the way. Um, the problem with flu is that we get antigenic variation and we have to make a new vaccine every few years. Conserved flu epitopes have also been found. And again, they are also extensively hypermutated. So again, the, the challenge is to figure out how to make a, an antigen that will induce these antibodies. Now, in addition to antibodies, C, C, T cells are also important for controlling infection. And in fact, you may remember um, that in, in some of the earlier graphs, as the virus, uh, when, the, when the individual is first infected, the number of virus particles go up, the CT8 positive T cell number went up, and then both went down at the same time. So there's some evidence in people that CD8 positive T cells are important for bringing that initial uh, burden of virus down. Uh, and this is an experiment in uh, macaques that are infected with SIV. So you can't use HIV, it doesn't cause disease in, in these animals, but SIV will. Uh, and here's an example where you infect the uh, macaques with SIV, and then you look at uh, viremia, which is red here, and the number of CD8 positive T cells, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, with time. So you can see there's a burst of virus replication, and slightly lagging behind is a burst in the production of CTLs, and it coincides with the reduction in virus load. So this suggests that CTLs are important for controlling virus levels. It doesn't prove it, of course, but it's suggestive. So what do you do? You do an experiment. You remove CD8 cells from these animals. You can do that by giving them an antibody, which will deplete their CD8 cells. And then when you infect them with SIV, you see you have higher titers of virus that are not regulated in the course of this infection. So there is ample evidence that CD8s are also important. So we may also have to develop epitopes uh, that are 
going to stimulate the right CD8 populations. So this is a, a, a tough virus. Many people were work, are working on it, um, and it may take some time. Now, a few words about elite controllers we mentioned earlier. These are people who have normal, they get infected, they make virus, but they don't get sick. They have normal CD4 counts. Um, they have less than 50 copies of, of RNA per mil, and they go 10 years or more. They don't get antiretrovirals. Uh, they are infected. We know that there are very low levels of virus in them, but they never get sick. The infection never proceeds. One, and about one in 300 infected people, HIV infected people, are elite controllers. There are probably multiple reasons why these individuals um, do well. But obviously, as I said before, it's really important to study them and find out why, because you can get clues about how to control infection in other people. Um, one of the interesting things here in these individuals is that they are associated with favorable MHC types. So you know the, the MHC, the surface proteins that present uh, antigens to T cells are put into different categories, HLA types. And it's possible to show that two different HLA types called B57 and B27 um, are associated with uh, being an elite controller. So the idea is that in the course of HIV infection, remember the antigens vary so you escape antibodies. There are also T cell epitopes in the virus, and those vary as well. So you make a CD8 response to a T cell epitope, but then the next crop of viruses changes that, and they avoid it. Our, these particular HLA types are thought to be more flexible in terms of the T cell epitope that they can recognize. So these are thought to recognize a broader range of epitopes and it will accommodate the mutation that occurs during HIV replication. So in other words, in the course of the infection, these elite controllers, their HLA are recognizing all the CD8 epitopes that the virus is spewing forth and still able to lyse virus infected cells. And so we, we actually talked about this on a, on a podcast a while ago. This is a really nice nature paper where they modeled um, this theory. So that's one of the, con one of the uh, possibilities that an HLA type is regulating a controller, but there probably also are other issues, um, other, other aspects of the immune system are, are involved as well because these individuals are not uh, homogeneous. But as they say, they have, um, initially they didn't, we couldn't detect um, RNA in them because our detection methods weren't sensitive enough, but with improvement, we now know that they have very, very low copies of RNA. So the virus is replicating in them, but it's not being cleared. So figuring out uh, why this is the case would probably help our immunization as efforts. All right, any other questions about H? Yes. Okay, so the problem here is that you have some long-lived cell in your body that's got a provirus in it, right? So one thing people have tried is to treat patients with various cytokines. They, have been, they are known to um, initiate replication. So the idea would be, let's say you have a lately infected, long-lived progenitor. You kick, it into, you kick it into replicating with a cytokine. The virus kills those cells, and then you throw in antivirals, so... Um, then you get rid of all the virus. That doesn't work, okay? But people are trying other approaches, which is to use uh, various vector approaches to deliver uh, something to those cells, to, to hit, put a microRNA against the genome. So that's all in, in progress. The problem is that um, you can't hit all of the progenitor cells, that's, and so you're always going to have a few there, and that may be an obstacle. But this is a this is a pretty active area because for a long time the vaccine approach didn't seem like it was going anywhere. So people are trying to think of ways to get rid of these proviruses.